taking care. And uh, for the last 10 years, she's been in Bombay. 11 years. 11 years in Bombay running an organization called Pukar. Pukar is an organization which uh, um, started with and continues to do uh, a very, very interesting project which is called Barefoot Researchers. The idea essentially being that everybody can be a researcher and in fact we do need everybody to be doing research using very simple tools and it's a way of democratizing research methodologies and democratizing research knowledge. And the fundamental idea there is that you know best about your own lived life and lived experience. So what Pukar has been doing over the last 11 years is to train hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of young people. And I think now there is a large network of over 3,000 people who have been trained in different kinds of research techniques including mapping, uh, surveying, interviewing, and videography, so on and so forth. And you all may want to go and see the archives of their work on the Pukar website. It's a fantastic website. And uh, Bombay is a city of mills, Bombay is a city of port uh, land slums and that's the areas where their researchers have been working. So I'll stop here since Anita has already said that I should keep it really, really small and we are really lucky to have her here. So thank you for being here after a very long day and thank you Anand for this opportunity. It really gives me great joy uh, to connect and to share. So I'm essentially going to talk to you about the kind of work we do and why we do what we do. And please uh, feel free to stop me anytime. Mere dost saai hai, pastiyo se, aap please aage aaye, aaja aaye ga. Mere liye ye bohat khushi ki baat hai ki wo itne dur se is lecture sunne ke liye aaye hai. So aapka welcome. To all of you. Uh, so, um, this is my city. Um, these are the key words I think you, we all hear about in the 21st century, and all of these key words urbanization, globalization, technology, data, and knowledge have a specific impact <coughs> on people's health, positive and negative. So, I'm going to try and explore it with you. So I want to talk about public health in metros. This is one of my, one of the slums where we have been working on. This is a uh, Devla dumping ground and the slum begins right here. So the overview of my talk is essentially I'm going to tell you about slum health and why it needs to be a separate aspect of public health. And then I will talk to you about the research model that Anand just elaborated about, which, who are called barefoot researchers the youth who actually belongs to the slum communities whom we train. And then I will show you a bit of what we have done, we have been able to achieve through the data and the impact of that on the communities and the change we brought about, the transformation we brought about in the barefoot researchers, in the community and in the society at large. So why slum health should be a subset of public health? And one of the reasons is, uh, according to UN Habitat data, 881 million people live in slums today, or not today, but in 2014. And they are expecting that uh, by 2030, there will be 2 billion people living in the slums out of the 5 billion urban dwellers. So there has been a phenomenal growth of slums across the globe. And if slum is a very spatial entity, uh, which I think we have failed to accept and recognize in public health issues because that spatiality of slum has a peculiar impact on health. So when you look at impact of health related to poverty, it is not the same as impact of health for people living in slum. For example, in the city of Hyderabad, there are many, many poor people who live not in slums but in other areas. In the city of Mumbai, there are many, many, many people who live in the slums who are not poor. So those are two separate issues, especially when it comes to slum. And the impact of these se uh, separations has impact on health. Most of the growth in the slum population is going to happen in the tier two cities, 
50,000 to 100,000 population. That's the prediction. Are we prepared for this? No, and I think we all went through the question group uh, just a previous session and we all dealt with issues related to housing and land and affordable housing. So it is all comes together when we are looking at informal settlements and informal cities. Next. This is, by the way, the slum that we have been working on uh, since 2008. So let me tell you the why, where, what, and how of slums. So why do slums get owned? We have to talk about that first. And I'm sure you are aware of the push and pull factors when it comes to formation of slums. When it comes to push factors, it's all related to rural economy not providing enough opportunities, enough livelihood opportunities, related to poor agricultural practices, more input into agriculture, uh, bonded labor, uh, labor um, formalities that have take place for poor people in rural health, I mean rural sector. Also, um, ethnic violence, uh, displacement in India, a large number of rural people got displaced because of developmental projects like that, and I'm sure you are aware of that. And when we did research on uh, transgender communities in Mumbai, we found out that a lot of people actually have come to the cities to avoid the social ostracization that happens to them in villages, whether either they are Dalits or they are transgender, so a lot of other caste issues. So these are the push factors. What are the pull factors in the city? Thriving informal economy. Informal economy in all metros in India thrives to a great degree, and as we know, close to 80% of our economy is basically informal economy. Second is information that gets transmitted from the city to the uh, villages about the opportunities of the cities is grossly wrong many a times. Third is, of course, their social factors. When we looked at migration issues in uh, slums in Mumbai, there were usually three issues that came out predominantly. One was, of course, related to livelihood, social work. The second was family child. So somebody of my family is sitting in somewhere in Mumbai, so I'm going to go join them. And the third was, of course, to uh, get away from the exploitation that happens in villages. And then for cities like Mumbai, which still remains a theater of hope and uh, La La Land for many, many, many people, Bollywood is a huge attraction and it continues to be so. So these are the full factors that bring people into the cities and when they don't find a place anywhere, they settle into informal settlement. What is a slum? Now, if you try and locate the definition of slum, it changes from city to city, state to state, nation to nation, and it changes from time to time. So there is no uniform definition of slum, there is no uniform definition of legalized slum and illegal slum. We usually have gone by the United Habitat, I mean uh, UN Habitat definition of slum, which says it's a conglomeration of people, a certain number of people staying together who lack one of the five things that they need to have, access to water, access to sanitation, adequate space to live, uh, a structure which is durable, and a tenure. So those are the five conditions, and if you lack one or two of those conditions, then you are living in a slum. That is the definition which is globally accepted of slums, but as I said, even in Mumbai, this definition has changed multiple times, uh, depending upon uh, the whims of the policy makers. Uh, this is again, you can look, look at this slum, which is in, located in uh, about 20 minutes from Thor, which is the financial capital of the city. And this is a 60-year-old slum. So these are the, some of the things I would want to talk about when it comes to effects on health of the neighborhoods that they live on. Hazards. Physical, environmental hazards are extremely common in slums because usually where are slums 
located. They're always located in a place which is normally not inhabited by normal or you know, middle class or rich people. They are down the stream, upstream, on dumping grounds, next to polluting factories, near landslide. So all of these form hazards. In Bangladesh, in around uh, large percentage of the slums are in the flooding zone. So they get flooded every year. So those are the hazards. Fire hazards are extremely common in slums because of the illegal electricity connection. So they, these are the hazards slum people face, which has impact on health. Crime, very common, especially related to gang wars, drug-related crimes. They are a lot more common in uh, Mexico City, Rio, uh, Rio, Sao Paulo. That not so common in Indian slums. Drug wars, I'm sure you have heard of. Geographical factors affect people very deeply. And I just want to give you some examples which are very gut-wrenching. So I lived in Chicago for a long time. University of Chicago is located in a particular, uh, what you call it, pin code. No, each. So University of Chicago has its own pin code because it's big enough of a campus. Right? University of Chicago is also located in the south side of Chicago where most of the black people live. The right next to the University of Chicago, there is another different pin code. Now when you look at these two different pin codes, University of Chicago, mostly white people, academics, uh, in a, in a upper strata, upper echelons of economic and educational uh, activities. Next pin code, black people, mostly blue collar workers, or living on entitlements, very poor. You know what is the difference between the longevity of the two zip codes? Anybody could guess? 20 years. Somebody said 20 years? Yeah, 20. Okay, it is 11 years. 11 years, right next to each other. And if you look at the richest uh, neighborhood in Chicago, which is on the north side, where all the white rich old money people stay, that difference is um, 13 or 14 years. And this study was done not too long ago. This was 2007 study. So this is not 50 years ago or 20 years ago I'm talking about. This is the difference between longevity when it comes to where you are born and where you live. Institutional factors. Uh, where you live has a huge impact on how you get treated by institutions in the city. So in Dharavi, where we work, we did a lot of research on the youth. What we found is A, they do not tell their addresses when they are looking for jobs. Because if they say they live in Dharavi, they are getting no jobs. B, when they go to get admissions in the colleges, many of the people are denied admissions because they live in Dharavi. Hence, it is assumed that you're not good at any study. So, doesn't matter how much percentage you have, you will not be admitted to good schools. Now, this is a research data, okay? This is not some coming out of my own app. And I have the data, anybody is interested, I'll be happy to share. So, I'm going to take you to Kalamata. This is a locality, as I said, 60 years old, non notified slum, sitting on a Bombay Port Trust land, which is a federal entity. Hence, the BMC or the local body says we cannot provide you with any services. No water, no electricity, no toilets, uh, no tenure. It is 20 minutes from port. So that's Bombay, South Mumbai. Okay, so let me tell you where is port and where are we located. So this is port and we are looking at this place. Next. And you see? Okay, next. So that's the wharf that is jetting right into the water, surrounded by water on all three sides, but no water to drink. None, zero. And up to 60 years, they are in the same shape. These are the demographic, mother's employment status, language, Hindi, Urdu, Marathi, Tamil. It's basically a bipolar community, a 42% population Tamil, 
52% Muslims coming from Bihar, Uttar Pradesh, some from Bangladesh, some 120 Christian families, and some other uh, some other families. So predominantly bi bilingual, Urdu and Tamil. Here I really want to draw your attention to the mother's education. So please notice that 45% of the mothers cannot read and write. Along with the Harvard School of Public Health, which is my school, uh, and New York University, we did 11 studies in this neighborhood from 2008 all the way to 2013. Uh, we did six studies which were quantitative and next, and we did another six studies which were qualitative. And we have tons of data, but I just want to share with you some few things about it. So how did we next? How did we perform this empirical research over a five-year period in this song? We have a very specific model developed for this, which is called, next, our model, which is called community-based participatory action research. It is a model which is based partly on Professor Arjun Apadurai's seminar essay called Rightful Research and partly from Paulo Freire's pedagogy, alternative pedagogy principles. We believe that research can be done by anybody. We don't have to be doctors and scientists and PhD docs. Uh, and we have challenged the mode of producing knowledge. Uh, we have challenged the profile of the researcher and the knowledge ownership in this particular model. We have used community-based participatory action research as a specific tool towards community development and we have been doing this for 11 years and very successfully in multiple communities across the metropolitan region. And um, what we have noticed is basically this model takes youth living in that particular community who gets trained to do research. So we are not paratrooping on a particular community. We are training the youth in that community. They are the ones who will be the researchers. They are the ones who will be learners and the knowledge producers at the same time. And this is an asset-based practice because we believe that every youth who lives in the community and every member who lives in the community has a reasonable knowledge about his or her own community. We need to build upon that knowledge find out what their problems are and find a solution where they actually participate in the entire process. So I'm just going to tell you how we do this. So we, wait, wait, go back. So we create a team of barefoot researchers by, in the community by building a community wrap-up. Then we train them in research instruments. That instruments include survey, uh, surveys interviews. Basically, surveys, interviews, photography, and mapping, those are the four tools we use most extensively. And then occasionally we will do focus group discussions and long-term case studies. Currently, we are doing a case study of 60 families in Mandala slum over a period of two years where they will be interviewed every two months because we want to look at health-seeking behavior of poor people in a slum. But that's not commonly done. So commonly we do, do surveys, instrument, uh, surveys, interviews, photography and uh, mapping. The reason to do photography is we believe documentation is intervention. The minute you document something, you have already intervened as a, in the community process. Uh, we do training of the researchers in research ethics. This is done very seriously. So ethics forms a very critical part of the research we do. So ethics and rigor in research are very critical to Pokhar. When we teach them research ethics, we literally start from Nuremberg, where the research ethics were actually born. From there all the way to today, uh, they are trained in research ethics and they are also trained in communication. And usually the first workshop on communication is related to empathetic listening. Because mostly, most people in India don't want to listen, right? We only want to talk and we only want to argue. So the first thing they need to do is 
unlearn certain things and learn to listen. And we usually have two to three workshops on empathetic listening and communication. Everybody is taught uh, ICT skills because majority of these kids have not seen computers. Many of them may have mobile phones now, but very few of them have smartphones. Please understand that. A lot of people are under the wrong impression that everybody carries a smartphone. That's not the truth. So we have to teach them ICT skills. Everybody is taught a right to information because a lot of times we are wrong to get information unless we put an RTI on. We also, like Gautam was saying this afternoon, we, they are also taught how to ask a proper question when you do an RTI. Because unless you do a great question, you are not going to get any answer. Uh, then they are also taught about subject of research. So they are doing research on immunization, they need to know why, what are the diseases they are preventing. If we are doing a research on diarrhea, they need to understand everything about diarrhea. If we are doing research on diabetes and blood pressure, which is what currently we are doing, we had to put them through four workshops just to teach them what is diabetes and what are the, all the questions that they are going to face when they are going to go and uh, interact with the community. And of course in that, this entire process, which is a fairly lengthy process, they also develop communication skills and they become leaders and change makers for their own community. So now I'm going to run through some of the slides very quickly, which shows this process. So we start first community rapobere. This process takes long time. These are three of my colleagues. They are sitting in Mandala, which is in, in this world. Uh, this is for our office. These are our barefoot researchers and they are going to workshop on research ethics. Next. They all get trained in ICT in the field office. Everybody is taught how to do mapping. Every single person has to learn how to map. And there is huge perspective on mapping which has developed in, I would say, the last four to five years. And mapping has become a very, very critical instrument in empowering poor communities. A uh, large amount of literature worldwide has talked about mapping as an instrument for empowerment and how people can actually take this mapping data to the policy makers and negotiate their own space in their own favor. So I would, I mean those of you who are interested and I think I have put that in the work that I cited, there are many citations related to mapping. Photography as I told you we do a lot of photography and most of the photographs you are going to see here actually done by our barefoot researchers. See, this is the map we created. This is a GIS map. This was related to the water taps in Kuala Bandar. You can see the war. And those are the... This is a map we ultimately gave to the water commissioner for him to put the water taps down in the community. This is a service delivery map of another slum, Gazdarbal. Again, we created this map. Barefoot researchers living in Gazdarbal were trained to do this. They created this map and then they took it to the local corporator, one Mr. Khan, and ultimately he ended up putting up a health post in the community. So what are the unique features of um, CDPR? The most critical thing what we found is because the youth is from the community, they have a large amount of trust of the people whom they are surveying or they are interviewing or they are questioning. The kind of granular information they can get from the people, I could never get. Because I am an outsider. They don't recognize me. But they say, oh, this is Bali, this is my name. And this is Kajo, this is my name, this is my name, this is my name, this is my name. So the information that they can gather from the community is phenomenally granular and very close to truth that what you and me as PhD track students or postdocs ever gather. Uh, it is an asset-based knowledge creation and I talked about that. Another thing which we found very critical is that they have access to community people anytime. So what happens is when we did, we were doing this, this thing on TB, we did uh, uh, research on hypertension, now, if you are finding a person who is halfway in the treatment of TB and who has quit, we have to go back, find him and say, Bhaiya, 
आपको वापस जाना है इस तरह आप छोड़ नहीं सकते हो लेकिन वो भैया कहने के लिए कोई मिलता नहीं है ना सुबह आठ बजे चले जाते हैं रात को ग्यारह बजे वापस आते हैं सो हाउ डू यू एक्सेप्ट ओके निजा दिस इज योर लेन दैट पेशेंट इज इन योर लेन प्लीज गो टू हिम एट इलेवन ओ क्लॉक एट नाइट एंड रिमाइंड हिम दैट ही नीड्स टू गेट टू दॉस्पिटल टू मॉरो You and me could never do that, but they can do it because they live there. They have access to the community anytime, and they have trust of the community. They say, "Ha, my neighbor ka ladka hai na aaya hai. Main uske saath ja sakta hoon." And of course, granular information that I talked about next. That's Nizam and that's Kadar and that's Bali. These are my uh, bare bones researchers. I have to tell you the story of Nizam. So Nizam. was a mochi mochi manu na tabla tabla thank you um after eighth grade he had to give up schooling because his father died of tb and there was nobody is the eldest in the family he lives in that slum he had to give up his schooling and the business of you know cobbler there he joined us in 2009 he continued to work with us we only work on saturdays and sundays बिकॉज मंडे टू सैटरडे कोई लोग मिलते नहीं है स्लम्स में सुबह चले जाते हैं रात को आते हैं इफ यू हैव टू डू एनी सर्विस वी कैन ओनली डू एट लिस्ट इन मुंबई सैटरडेज एंड संडे अदरवाइज यू ओनली फाइंड वीमेन अदरवाइज नो बडी एल्स इज अवेलेबल ओवर द पीरियड ऑफ फोर इयर्स निजाम गॉट ऑफ रिमबर्स फॉर द वर्क ही डिड सेव द मनी वेन बैक टू स्कूल कंप्लीटेड इज ट्रॉ टूडे ही वर्क इन माई ऑफिस एज माई कॉलेज टू मी दैट्स अ रियल सक्सेस स्टोरी that's true transformation so at nizam is not the only one i have bali like that i have kajol like that i have siddiqui like that i have out of the 29 colleagues that i have in pukar 70% of them have come out of this barefoot researchers program and today they are my colleagues and i feel extraordinarily proud of them that these were the kids who were living in slum they still live in slum because you know most nobody can afford to get out of slum But at least they are on their own. They have learned to do tremendous skills. They are economically independent to a certain degree, and they have a bright future. So I have a great faith in this instrument because I have seen the fruit of it over the last 11 years. Uh, this is the same community. Youth is engaged in a positive work. They have partial livelihood opportunities. they have importance of self and community and they need find solutions i have to give you another story we are working in a tribal district in north of mumbai which is about 140 km north of mumbai this is the newly minted tribal district of maharashtra and we are working on digital literacy we took the same model we used with the same model we created 60 uh, 87 e sevaks so they teach people how to use particular uh, specific uh, schemes which are available on the internet so that they can save their money daily wages etc etc i don't want to go long into that but all these 87 kids who have been youth who have been working with them many one of them have become now micro entrepreneurs they have started their own businesses because of the skills they have learned and they say we don't have to go to bombay to find a job so at this to a small degree the migration has been halted now i don't know how long this will last but at least for the time being we say oh we are going to stay in their own village and start this own businesses uh surveys this is saira doing survey in a uh, uh mandala we did uh, anthropometric studies in pala bandar same thing next So what did we find? So you will say you did so many studies. What did we find? So we looked at slum adversities specifically. So what were the problems that really created or really troubled people in in Pala Bandar? Lack of access to water, huge, because people will end up spending anywhere from 10% to 30% of their monthly income buying water. lack of access to sanitation we already talked about it durable housing most people in slums do not want to uh, invest in making the house better because they don't have tenure and in slum at least in mumbai the guys who live on the bottom almost always build another room on the top and rent it out 
So they become landlords without having a tenure or without having possession of their own home. But that happens. That happens probably everywhere. Does it happen, Anand, here in uh, Hyderabad? He, they will rent it out. So the same story probably happens everywhere. So nobody wants to invest into any housing because it's not theirs. Lack of enough space. So when we did the research on uh, in, in the slum, people would sleep sitting up because they have the average household in Kuala Bandar is anywhere from 80 square feet to 100 square feet. The average number of people 4.6. So we are looking at 5 people for 100 square feet basically. People would sit up and sleep. People would sleep outside in non-monsoon times. People would have huge problems because they could never invite guests. The worst thing was many, many, many women ended up going back to the villages for delivery. Because after delivery, they didn't go to the house. And then when they go to deliver, which they go in the later stages, we have found cases where women have delivered in the trains, women have delivered in the rickshaws, women have delivered from train station to the village because they have to go by bus. We have had kids with all these three types in Kala Bandar. Also because once they go to village, they don't come back for three, four months. That means no immunizations. Because they don't know and they will not go and seek out the doctor in village. So these are all the impacts of living in slum and how it impacts their health. Uh, lack of tenure, uh, vector borne disease is huge. Malaria, dengue, chicken dunya, typhoid, you name it, they have it. And the worst thing was rats. Rats bite, rats take away food, and rats take away many things. Clothing, they will chew out clothing, so they destroy, they are hugely destructive at least in Mumbai. So people were frustrated about it. So these were all the uh, slum adversities that people faced, and they talked about it very, very openly. Now, I don't know if you see it, but this was the immunization data we uh, came up with. And we found out that I just want to do one of it because it's too long a story. Measles immunization in Kalabanda was 32% compared to 80% uh, in other slums and 90% in the city. So now what did we do about that? You will say, oh, Anita, you only talk about it. So did we do anything good for the community? Yes, we did. So we took this data to Manisha Maestra, she was the health commissioner, and we said we need health care. Because there is no school around, there is no health post around, even though the population is 15,000. And she said, I can't give you a health post because you are on Bombay, Port Trust land, but I can send you health camps twice a month, which is what she started. We started the health camps. This is the uh, statistics for slum health. And I think I'm going to let you read it for 30 seconds. Good? We went door to door telling people, Chalo, chalo, doctor aa rahe, abhi tumhare bachche ka tikya hone wala hai. We created posters like that. Remember I told you the, the literacy rate in the slum is only 48% uh, of the women can't read and write. So we had to prepare everything pictorially. This is what we prepared. Then we thought that we also had to educate them about diarrhea. This is the statistics of diarrhea. Repeated episodes of diarrhea lead to intergenerational poverty. This is very important for all of you to know because diarrhea leads to stunting. Stunting leads to very, very poor cognitive growth of the child. Poor cognitive growth leads to poor educational achievements. That leads to poor income uh, opportunities. And then the poor guy marries another poor woman and gives rise to poor children and it continues all the time. So diarrhea is a horrible disease in short term as well as in long term. Next. So we decided we needed to teach people about diarrhea. We created these kind of posters. Mostly this is pictorial. You don't have to read and write. We also taught them how to make ORS because it's something people need to understand. Next. And then our barefoot researchers went door to door teaching them about this. So this is the most critical part of everything we do. So the action is based upon the research data. What these communities need is what we deliver to them. It's not based upon somebody sitting in an AC office working on his PC. So we are not AC PC organization. We actually work on the ground. Community education we did on TV. We screen TV films, we create next. 
created uh, posters which talk about TB's uh, symptoms. We told them they have to get their sputum tested, their x-rays, and they need to get onto the therapy. Next, uh, we created uh, these posters, how they should avoid spread of the uh, disease. I don't know how many of you know, but Bombay slums are where um, uh, MDR TB is. Uh, MDR TB cases are maximum in the country, which is multi drug resistant TB. Majority of the MDR TB cases are in Mumbai slums. In Bombay slums are host, uh, house the maximum TB patients in the country. So we really need to be very aggressive about TB treatments in Mumbai. Uh, I'm going to just quickly give you uh, some data on, uh, in water on Mandala. Mandala is a slum located in MS Ward. Uh, there are many houses. We just took Indira Nagar and Martan Rishi Nagar. The total household was 2298. We coded every single house. We randomized 600 houses. Uh, and then we looked at water poverty. Now you will say, what is water poverty? So WHO says, that every human being must receive 50 liters per capita per day to be reasonable. That's a minimum need. When you go down to 20 liters per capita per day, that means you are in water poverty. And at that level, the uh, incidence of diseases, infectious diseases, rises very dangerously. So, households spend 1875 rupees on water in previous month. That forms 10.3% of their monthly income. So, Mandala is at the other end of the city. Kalabandar, which I showed you earlier, is at the other end of the south end of the city. Mandala is at the north end of the city. Situation remains the same. On an average, 24 liters per person per day was water was available to people. Days without enough water, average liters per person per day. And then we looked at number of days without enough water with a very good p value. Those of you who understand the statistics. We looked at percentage of household consuming less than 20 liters per capita per day and number of days without enough water. Next. And we looked at, I mean, we looked at multiple things. I just got three slides for you to show. Days without enough water, number of households and days without enough water. So this is the kind of research we continue to do. We look at data, we take this data. Now we are going to take this to the policy makers because Bombay High Court actually uh, came up with the rule that every single person in Mumbai, whether in illegal slum or in legal slum or any places, must receive 50 liters per day per capita. Of course, there is no implementation on that. But we want that to be implemented in the slums where we are working. So all this data, now we can take this data, go to the policy makers and say, you are actually not implementing the high court question. <coughs> so this is the message to take home, that slum health should be distinguished from urban health and mainstream into the implementation of sustainable development goal. I think, I don't know how many of you are familiar with sustainable development goal, but there is a specific area related to slum health and yeah, public health. So, Thank you for listening and any questions I'll be happy to take. I almost finished on time. what are the signs and symptoms, all of that, like we look at everything else. The, the, one of the reasons it was so hugely successful was that the, all the youth lives there. See, this is the advantage we have. They are their neighbors, their neighbors' kids. So, if, if when at the end of all these 11 projects, when we ask all our barefoot researchers, out of all these 11 projects, which was the one you liked the most, and I have I had the uh, interviews which are on YouTube, you can go and see. They all said mental health is something we like the most. Kyu Baba, because they said people share their agonies and their grief with us. 
and we felt very good that we are helping them in some way or the other directly. We were the help people because they were like counselors without training. So they got terrific information and we found the help of a percentage of people who are depressed very, very high. We did send it to Dr. Patel, who is a very well-known psychiatrist in India who has done the maximum amount of research on depression. So he's actually going to come back and join us for taking this project. But it was amazing what information we got. We also did WHO's general health questions in that. Yes. Instead of saying, oh, but in larger community, this is what is prevalent. So we ultimately did all the project, research projects on the issues that was pertinent to this particular community. So I'm sure what you're saying is perfectly correct, but these were the issues that came from them. So whenever we did find other people complaining, we would usually send, give letters to them and send them to KEM or JJ, the big government hospitals with a letter and we will send our barefoot researchers with them. But we decided to do, and we have always done that, we do research only on those subjects or needs that come out of our basic needs assessment survey of each community. Mandala, why water? Because that was their problem. So we have always done that. So you are right, but that was not their problem. Yes, because uh, as you said, cannabis is a big problem among the entire slum. So Sure. 
what happens is uh, you do increase their thinking behavior and other things as well. But uh, is that sustainable without your presence? Will they continue to seek help? And uh, are they demanding more services from you? Because this is something that uh, usually comes when you start supporting the community. So that's a very good question, and actually we have a great answer for that. So what happened <coughs> in Kolabanda, when we started the health camps, for whatever reason, the doctor didn't show up, right? Bali will call, Didi, oh, doctor nahi aaya. Are bhaiya, tumhare paas number hai, tum phone karo. But they did not have the confidence or the uh, self-esteem to pick up the phone and call a doctor from KM hospital. This was when we started in 2009. Today, does Bali or Kajol or Nizam need us? Not at all. Go phone karke uthate, kao tum saare dat pehle tumhe ya ana tha nahi aaye. They have developed that confidence, they have developed that self-dignity. Uh, many people from the community come to them, some, uh, something they answer, something they cannot answer, they call. They say, oh, this is a sawal aya hai, abhi kya kiya jai. But they have certainly become leaders and health ambassadors in their own community. This is not just in Kolabanda. We saw this in Mandala. We saw this in uh, Shivajinagar in uh, Mankot. We saw this in Dara. So I'm just giving you example. But I have seen this year after year after year where this youth gets so transformed by the process and the skills that they become the game changers for their own community. So we don't have to worry about sustainability. They carry that on. Yes. Do you think you could do the same thing? Do you think a barefoot researcher could be a volunteer as opposed to being just being a full time job? No, absolutely not. Let me be very clear on it and I have never hesitated to say this. This whole concept ki volunteer log ye karenge, wo karenge, sure people may do it for some time, but we cannot hold them accountable for anything because they are volunteering. You cannot deal with community like that. Ki haan, jab aayenge, aayenge, karenge, jab nahi aayenge, to nahi karenge. We owe something to that community where we are working. It is our job to be accountable to the community first and foremost. And volunteers are now going to make us accountable. We consider ourselves deeply accountable to that community. So, no volunteering. No, not at all. And I told you, in, in the barefoot researchers processes, what are we doing? We are giving them skills. We are giving them self-dignity. We are transforming them. We are also giving them partial reimbursement through which most of my colleagues actually went back to schools, completed schools, joined other schools, and became economically independent. I would not say we made them economically independent, but we were certainly the catalyst for doing that, and we certainly helped them to a small degree. The rest, everything they did, the credit belongs to them, not to us. But we certainly were catalyzing that process. So no, we don't go into volunteering. Okay, I think we should uh, bring this to a close, right? So anybody has more questions, I'll be happy to answer. Thank you. Thank you, Anita, for your wonderful presentation. And I just want for, um, just want all of us to remember that there is a historical specificity of this program. It happened in Bombay at a particular time. We can learn lessons from that, translate them into other places. Projects like that can never be replicated as it is. I think one of the mistakes that we have uh, been committing over the last 20 or 30 years is this attempt, particularly in the, uh, in, in the area of, of uh, non-profit work, is to build models that are supposed to scale up. And that scaling up is almost always resulted in disaster outside of those countries. But that's not our experience. We took the same model and took the part of
You did. That's what I'm saying. In particular context, in particular places, it works. It doesn't always work. So we need to think about why it works in such sure. context and why it doesn't work in other contexts, right? And I think that that, that that inquiry is really, really important. I mean, the government of India runs ASHA program. <coughs> very, very different kind of experiences in different places. Very different grassroots organizations emerge in different cities with very different kinds of aspirations and so on. I think we need to think about that. Um, with that, we will close this for today.